Yeah, good. Uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody else. Thanks for coming. Uh, kind of a small crowd, but I think we have some competition uh, with a, something at the high school tonight. Uh, Christmas. Oh, yeah, music. Concert. Christmas oh, concert. concert. So everybody's going to leave. <laughs> now you're just going to If it gets boring, you can go. Yeah, well, this will be casual. It's kind of something we do every year. Uh, in advance of the Christmas bird count, we try to review the number, you know, some, some group of birds. What was that? Or did you have a question? No, he's oh. chatting about the spreadsheet. Okay. Analyzing data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, um, anyway, we try to review some small group of birds just as a primer before the Christmas bird count, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Christmas bird count itself um, and hope that you all come and participate in it uh, this Saturday morning. Um, so, I'll back up just a little bit. We start most meetings with asking people about recent sightings of, you know, any interesting birds or other wildlife that they've seen lately. Does anybody have anything? Uh, yeah, I managed to get out to Hartney on Sunday. It was actually a pretty morning even though it was snowing. Um, there was tons Hi. of ducks out there. There was probably 300 mallards, uh, buffleheads, a uh, couple common golden eye, big flock of common mergs that were um, fishing in tandem. That was uh, kind of fun watching them do their little fishing thing. Um, and then I spotted a hawk owl out of Alleghany a couple weekends ago. Oh, yeah. I saw a hawk owl out on the top of the highway. You did it within the count circle, you think, before the airport? or? Oh, this was, no, no, this was a couple weeks ago. Okay. But this side of the airport or the other? Let's see. Uh, no, it was... Uh, Nine miles. Oh, okay, so count circle. Hopefully it was the Good. Way. We got dive bombed and almost got hit by an owl before we could even see it. It almost smacked into the window as we came around the corner, but that was like at 20, about 24 miles. Okay. Yeah. At night? No. Oh, in daytime? Twilight. 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 Oh. As in just out the light. Nope. <laughs> 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 had a shrike out of Allegheny. Oh. And a shrike? Yeah, that's right. It's shrike. too bad Allegheny's outside our count circle. Town? But, yeah. What? In town? Allegheny. Allegheny. Yeah. yeah, it's really important. <laughs> and I've been still getting lots of reports of Anna's hummingbirds. Um, oh. Diane Weiss has put up a heated feeder, and she's got a bird that's come into her feeder, at least one. And... Um, uh, Liz Snare has got at least one bird coming to her place out here on Cedar Street. Vic Jones does occasionally. He could be sharing a bird with Six Mile, but it's hard to say. Uh, so we got some places to stake out for hummingbirds, which is a very unusual winter bird, but regular for us. It's become that. Um, anybody else? Any any other neat sightings? Um, King, Kingfishers in uh, at Hartney Bay today and the lagoon a couple days ago. Good. Just outside the count circle. Uh huh. And four pin tails. Well, let's hope they're in the count circle. We got low tide for a lot of the day on yeah. Saturday, so that could push things in the water closer yeah. to the mouth. Yeah. I think I, I think the EAC um, in the scops. There's uh, there's a tufted duck. There's a female tufted duck. Female type. Male, the young male, female tufted duck, and a couple of redheads out there. So those would be. Good for the, get. Good for the yeah. on, on EA. Um, this side of of the Power Creek arm, you know, as you're going into the um, the what North Arm. So just just as you're kind of entering the North Arm, but more in the main body of the okay. lake. Um, I'll tell you about Count Week here in the slideshow. But starting tomorrow, these birds that can be difficult to get matter. So I want people to start reporting what you see and recording what you see tomorrow. I'll talk about Count Week here in a minute. And, oh, owls are good. Yeah. And I haven't seen that much lately um, out in the boat, outside of the Count Circle here in recent weeks. I've seen uh, sooty shearwaters a few times, which are neat seabirds that don't come into the sound, usually until unless we have stormy weather, 
uh, I saw three one time and one <laughs> another, which is kind of cool. And yeah, that's true. That's probably why they've been there. They were on very nice days the times that I that I saw them, and it could be all the nasty weather that's driven them in. And yeah, the theater activity seems really low. I haven't even stocked mine yet. I'm telling everybody else to, but uh, there's just not many seed-eating birds. Um, siskins or red poles around which could mean our, our count numbers you know will be low i think this weather has been so nasty things have chosen to be elsewhere yeah i've only gotten chickens well, um, I saw yeah. a small flock of something today that made me think wax wings but they were going away from oh, me wow. but they had that that flock left uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> Since I'm going to uh, talk about, or Aaron and I are going to talk about owls tonight, uh, I thought I'd bring up this spreadsheet. Uh, this is the, uh, the spreadsheet of all the years of Cordova's Christmas bird count. And uh, if anybody wants to see this at, at leisure, um, come see me or I can email you a copy of it. Uh, I won't give you a live copy, but a PDF of it or something um, if you wanted to see. So anyway... Our count started in 72. Uh, this is our 47th count. Uh, this isn't all the way updated yet. And uh, the owls that have been recorded on the route are right here. And we've seen great horns, northern sawmet, northern hawk <coughs> owl, short-eared snowy boreal, and western screech. Uh, snowy owl, I think it's just one count week record. And X isn't, isn't the number of birds. It means it was seen in count week, just the species count. And I didn't see where the boreal came from here. It began as a boreal, seen in Count Week in 1980. Looks like there's some individual sightings there. Yeah, are. some individual sightings in 97, 98. That's pretty neat. So uh, anyway, we don't get, the, the bottom line is, and what I wanted to show you here is, uh, oh, and probably the most regular one that's seen on the count, I'm going to guess, is going to be the northern hawk owl. And you can see it's pretty regular, it shows up, although there's a spanning 10 years or more where there's very few, or more than that. In fact, there used to be a lot more than there are now. Just look at the early years here. Um, not a lot more. And anyway, that's the one that we probably get most regularly, uh, is the northern hawk owl. But owls, you know, by nature, are mostly nocturnal. Uh, most of them are. Um, they're secretive and uh, you know, we all love seeing them, but, but just don't see them all that often. <coughs> so, so oh, I've got to start with the slideshow. <coughs> so we thought we would review, you know, kind of a charismatic uh, group of birds for everybody and uh, talk about the ones that we have a chance at seeing and the one. Well, the, these all occur here, um, but some we have slightly better chances than others and talk about how to find them. And uh, you can actually target them and go looking. And uh, so we'll see what we can, uh, what we can do here. Uh, Aaron and I have compiled a bunch of pictures um, that kind of show these birds in different views and things like that and have a few experiences we can relate. Um, does anybody, everybody know what this owl here is? Northern hawk owl. Yeah, northern hawk owl. That is the one that we're most likely to get on our Christmas bird counts, and they're a daytime owl. They're diurnal, and this is often how you see them out the road. Usually, I've seen them on the ski hill before, um, you know, perched on the top of a tree like that. So that's the one. That, so we kind of broke this down into diurnal owls, the ones that you can see in daylight, and then we'll go to these nocturnal, secretive buggers that you hardly ever see but are more likely to recognize by song or their calls. Uh, so we'll start with the ones that you have a chance of seeing. This is the northern hawk owl. Um, you saw the report, you know, how, it, you know, even our most common owl is still seen in very low numbers and you kind of have to look for them. And I think Aaron's got a little bit of a knack for that. Uh, you'll sit <laughs> on the gravel pile, the sand pile. The sand pile is a good spot to and just look at all the tops of alders and spruce on the delta with a spotting scope or binoculars is how you might pick one of these out. They like to sit on snags and uh, um, anyway, there's some around. You know, uh, was it Michelle said you, no, who said you saw one recently? Both of you have, saw, have seen them recently. We didn't, we 
couldn't tell. Yeah, okay. Smacked, but you saw one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I always remember the long tail. Yep. And, the the and they're brain. they're very <laughs> habitual. So if if you saw one a few weeks ago, there's a really good chance it's in the same area. It'll be there for the winter, and maybe has been there. And repeated years, the same individual comes back. It, it might be a it might be a nesting bird out there. I saw one um, last spring, and well, in the Alleghenic. Yeah, um, here, but that was a different area, I guess. But oh yeah, but there's nice. Alleghenic um, uh -huh. yeah. bird hanging out too. Yeah, well, I agree with what Paul said, but it's also the position of the bird can make the tail look real short. If the uh -huh. tail's pointing at you, yeah, yeah, it looks short. Whereas, yeah. There you can see it well because it's uh, profile, you know, sideways yeah. to you. But here, it, well, it's lined up with branches. But the, this is the typical pose how you might see them in the top of the tree, and they can be quite tame if you are lucky yeah. enough to see. What the, they can allow you to walk very close to them, and they're a treat. Any owl is a treat to see in person because uh, of the big eyes and the faces and everything. These are mostly. Uh, visual hunters, you know, their their uh, their eyes are very good. They'll see a mouse from half a mile away, literally. Um, and in the summer, they tend to prefer. There are studies that show that they tend to prefer more of a mammal diet, and in the winter, more of a um, bird avian um, diet. But that's you know, general. general mm -hmm. they we'll take snowshoe yeah. hares sometimes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a sipiter, almost a sipiter-like flight in a way. But this shows how even a diurnal, a daytime owl, could be a little bit hard to find if they're roosting in a forest or in, in open branches like this. Uh, owls can be hard to see. There's a classic Aww. view of the shape of the bird and the long tail that Paul was talking about. And here's another uh, northern hawk owl, right? What? No. no. What do we got here? <laughs> Short-eared owl? Yeah, so this is another bird, another owl that can be really active in the daytime. We have, even in summertime, they're here, but in small numbers, you kind of have to be looking for them out on the Delta and on the barrier islands. Uh, sometimes in Hartney Bay, uh, I've seen them when I've been duck hunting there. Um, anyway, uh, to me, at least if you see one roosting, the, the greatest field mark is that black, those black rings around the eyes, kind of like raccoon eyes. Uh, here's one in flight. You can see the same uh, black rings around the eyes here. And is that yours? Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. Wild. I took this in Vancouver. Uh, but yeah, they're striking birds. Uh, and they fly around a lot, whereas uh, a hawk owl is a, hunts from a perch. These often fly, uh, hunt from, on the wing, and they have a real distinctive wing beat. Uh, they fly very similar to harriers in the uh, way they hunt. I mean, harriers yeah. have a really dihedral right. mm. wing. These guys are flatter, but they do the same thing. They'll course back and forth across the field, just yeah. over the tops. Uh, These kind of have that kind of jerky that. Yeah. I've always kind of thought right. that they kind of like don't know when to flap their wings. Uh, <laughs> they, they do it in, in weird strokes, just like he described. Uh, I, I've seen them in Montana more often in the past hey. than I've seen them here. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk about the wing pattern? And, uh... Uh, they're, they're very light. Some birds are, some birds, there, there's quite a, a variation between darker uh, short eareds and lighter short eareds. Um, so if you see a really light bird, it might not be a snowy. It might, you know, and the underwing is very, very white. So that can kind of fool you into thinking, especially if it's, if you, you know, your headlights hit it in the evening. It might, you know, make you think that it's a snowy owl, um, but snowy owls don't really have that jerky kind of odd flapping flight. They're much more fluid, um, heavy, heavy flapping kind of flight. Uh, so anyway, here's another view. Yeah. yeah. There was one year there was like two dozen of them on the Alganic Road. Right. That? That yeah. Was a lot. Yeah, they must have pulled off a good clutch that year, and everybody was seeing them. They'd land, stand on the road that's yeah. itself, and yeah. If you're if you're fishing, if you're on the if you're on a gill net or on a boat out in the in the Gulf of Alaska, these will come by. They they do cross Gulf um, migrations, 
and and I know people who have them circling their their boats um, during silver salmon season. You did? Yeah. yeah that yeah. was crazy. Yeah. Right as the it was getting kind of darker, it was uh -huh. rain green. Yeah. And yeah, it was insane. There was a there was four. Was it good luck or bad luck? Did you catch a lot of fish? In I had day? singles twice. Okay. We we had several at one time. Wow. And you know you had I think you had a light on. Uh huh. Was it good luck or bad luck? Did you catch a lot of fish the next day? <laughs> no, but it was really magical. Yeah, cool. And this is Aaron's picture. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, where they where the the short-eared owl entered, basically went in to, to get a mouse. A uh, very a very small opening about that big, and then it just jumped straight out of there. Huh. Yeah, there's no yeah. wing flaps or without the mouth, no, but showing no. it taking off. It, it, you know, it must have just like jumped out of the hole and took flight. Uh, that's what he was saying. They'll they'll disappear into the snow if you watch them. They'll just go right in there and then pop right back out with the with the mouse. Great grays do that as well. Yeah. Feet, feet first or head first? Um, kind of kind of foot. You know, they'll they go in with their with talons. their talons, but it almost. Is like their their yeah. head and their yeah. feet are, are right right next to each other. Yeah. So it's Do they like, carry the mouse in their feet or their? No. They they get they grab it in the talons and then it's almost it's really difficult to watch to see if they get one because it's so such a quick transfer. When they hit the ground, they'll go down. If they grab if they got one, it'll just be this quick head jerk and that's it. Transfer to the bill. Popping it. Popping it down to their crop, or swallowing it that yeah. fast. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> and there's one more picture of a short-eared owl. Even though they call them short-eared owls, you don't see the short ears very often, the ear tufts. Uh, but this one is uh, alarmed at me trying to get its picture, and it has its tufts up a little bit. And uh, yeah, they do truly have short ears, but you don't see them very often. So uh, the the look you want to remember is more this with the round head uh, and the black, look for those black eyes, the black what, rings around. What's happening eyes. with the wings in that shot? There? Oh, it's just wet, it's a rainy day. I think I took this picture in Denali. And uh, yeah, just a wet owl. Boy, um, at about 25 miles, there's about 200 eagles. Oh, wow. We drove yeah. about the 36 mile the other day. <coughs> At least every other one had its wings out drying. Oh, trying to dry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> tree after tree. Just wow. Ten in a tree, all with their wings out. Neat. Cool. Here's another one we can dream of seeing around here, and there actually has been a report for this year. Does anybody know what this one is? Great gray. Uh, great gray. Yeah. Uh, has anybody seen a great gray here? Yeah. You have one or one? Uh, it's around the 16th of May. What um, year? Four years ago. Oh, oh really? That recent? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, and it was about miles. I thought you were going to say 73, no. 11 o'clock no. at night. <laughs> <laughs> May no. 15th. No, it was in the morning. Uh, it was about 8.40 in the morning. <laughs> uh, 16 mile. Yeah. So they're, they're uncommon around here. Well, they're rare around here. But Robert Massolini claims to have seen one off the Allegheny Road recently. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of a hope. They're, anyway, they are a rare bird here, but they are a diurnal owl, or at least they can be uh, quite active in the daytime. And they're magnificent, is all I can say. Um, do you want to talk? This is Aaron's picture here. Uh, it, it, there is one year in Anchorage when there are a, a whole bunch. But other than that, I've seen just a couple. In Alaska, since then, but um, there were maybe eight within one square mile um, by the, out the by the airport. The airport. The, um, what's the name of that halfway house? Um, the the um, oh, um, center, the Clitheroe Center. Yeah, Clitheroe Center. Yeah. So, yeah, right, right in there. Well, that was cool. what's so walk right up to them. spectacular yeah. is they're North America's largest owl by dimension, yeah. not by weight. Uh, but by dimension, because they are fluff, uh, they are all feathered, but they're large and they have this very rounded head. Uh, so this is, and, and great horned owls, which actually weigh more, uh, are very common around here, 
and they're a large owl also, not quite as long, but uh, you know, you want to look for that round, smooth head as opposed to a great horned owl that has horns that are usually visible, and I'll, we'll compare those or show you, show you the other one in a minute. This is what a great gray looks like. My pictures come from Montana. I haven't seen one in Alaska. Uh, I had the good fortune of knowing where a having show, somebody show me a nest uh, in the late 90s, and I set up a blind in a tree, uh, eye level with the nest, and for two springs I watched them raise their chicks out of the nest. And this, this one of the adults landed right next to me in the blind. In fact, I didn't even need to be in a blind. They, they just didn't care. Uh, but would land right next to me and look at me like this one did. did. How much larger than a, than a shorter your dog was? A, a, a third or twice the size, or, or, or a third again as big, uh, would be my guess. Uh, yeah, they, they look, the, the, the elongation is kind of like a, like an eagle perching out there. I mean, they're not maybe not quite that size. Mm -hmm. um, definitely not that mass, but they, you know, they take up kind of that same general area, that kind of elongated look. I don't know. And this again tree. shows the smooth round head and the magnificent large facial disc that great grays have. There's a close up of that one next to me in the blind. So I wonder if there's some difference. You said these were Wisconsin birds? Montana. Montana birds. So the Alaska birds, at least the ones that I've seen and in the books, those white spots on the bottom of the disc there are really pronounced. They, they call them milk spots. They, it, they call it a bow tie. It looks like or, they have a bow yeah, tie sometimes. Yeah, I've also seen that. Yeah. But, um, so the ones I saw in Alaska were really pronounced. Uh -huh. That white really stands out. Neat. Oh. And this is like one of my favorite pictures I ever took, uh, and I had to throw this in. It, this was in the late 90s on that nest that I was photographing for Two Springs. I woke up in Missoula one morning, and I saw in, in it was Mother's Day, May, whatever Mother's Day falls on. It had snowed uh, in the springtime, and I saw where the snow line was on the mountains, and this nest was about a two or three hour drive from where Missoula, where I lived, uh, near Deer Lodge and uh, the nest was near Deer Lodge. And so I saw where the snow line was and I thought, wow, I wonder if it snowed at the nest. So I drove all the way down uh, and then hiked into my nest, climbed up into my blind. And I didn't put, I only put this one picture in. When I got to the nest, it was you know kind of first light. Uh, the mother was on the nest, the female was on the nest, completely covered in snow on her back. And I couldn't see any chicks or anything. In fact, I didn't even know there were chicks in the nest yet. And then as she woke up, she shook the snow off and the male came back more times than I had ever seen bringing uh, pocket gophers or voles to, to feed it. And uh, I got to see the chicks for the first time. And on this snowy day, they fed them again and again. It was magnificent. Uh, and this is later on, these are the chicks in the nest. So it was one of my favorite photo uh, experiences ever, the two springs I got to follow these owls. Yeah. Darren, you mentioned uh, a nest, like at this time of year, do they, when do they exist? Oh, Owls in January, February. Oh, oh, as far as the, the great grays or in, in general? Any of them in general. Um, they, I, I think the, the great grays are, I think they are a little later than great horned. Yeah, great horned, great -horned are the early like semester. really early, maybe yeah. January, like midwinter, basically yeah. they'll start. Yeah. Why do they um, nest so yeah. early when it's so cold and dark and windy? And prey, prey, like, I think they want the, the prey abundance to peak when their eggs are hatching, um, when, when they're feeding the mouths. So it, I think it, it's locally determined, but okay, they, it can also, be very early. They take a little bit longer to get out of the nest than some other species yeah. of birds. So oh, they wow. need that extra couple of weeks. The timing, they're not. They're not precocial. Yeah. The timing of these great grays might be similar to the small of many of the other owls. Great horned are the yeah. very early nesters. That might even be singing in December now, uh, starting to. But uh, this nest was. They were sitting on eggs for much of, much of the month of April, and then they hatched and they raised their young and fledged them. You know, three weeks into May or so. And I think that's probably similar to the timing here. They're singing in March, maybe late February or March, you know, establishing their territories. Uh, they might be on nests sometime in April, the cavity nesting like screech owls or saw wets or orioles, uh, things like that. And then, uh, uh, you know, have young in, you know, 
May or June or even July. Uh, yeah. So, so they start nesting in January, or February. Great horn do. Yeah. They're going they after larger pulling, mammals. Establishing nesting territories, then they get on the nest and start laying. No. They so they, how how long is it between when they get on the nest and they start laying? Do they get, do they it can, lay it can be very variable. Well, look and look at the size yeah. of the young here. Uh, owls are interesting because they start incubating with the first laying of the first egg. They don't wait for a whole clutch to be laid, and so you get a nest with different aged young. And uh, smaller owls, they wait because there can be like yeah, 10, right. yeah. ten or fifteen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, larger ones, great grays, great horns. But uh, uh, anyway, they'll, some of these will start uh, incubating right away and might just lay three or four eggs or something. These larger owls. And then uh, a lot of times the runt ends up dying because it can't compete. If, if food's limiting, it'll be the young that gets pushed out of the nest or doesn't get enough uh, to eat. So, so they, um, they, 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 the, the eggs are laid, is it about two weeks or three weeks before Three weeks, hatch, incubation, so roughly. That puts it into like March maybe? Well, and great horned are the ones that start really early. The, all the others would start later than that, either oh, okay. Laying in April or May. Uh, uh, when would the great horn here hatch? Well, I, I don't know that anybody has that much data, but uh, they would. They could, they could be nesting, way. incubating in February or March. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Probably going after the hares, the snowshoe hares, which are turning. Yeah. They, they want to. Yeah. To I, I think they they want the prey about like the what they're they're. Um, the hares are reproducing the, what? In the spring. Spring, yeah. Right? So yeah. I think they want to coincide, the, the larger owls, like the great horned owls, want to coincide that event with, okay. you know, when they're raising their young, I think is one of the factors. But these guys are, they're, on um, the great grays, they're taking much smaller prey. As big um, as they look, they eat they're, bowls. They're so. <laughs> little, little guys, little yeah. bowls. And then shorter dolls nest quite a bit later, and yes, they can have summer. they can have. Uh, well, I've found seven young in a nest mm -hmm. on the East Delta. And back they nest in, on the ground. Yeah, on the ground. This was back in '76, I think, or '77. No, '78. In '78, uh, there were probably oh, I want to say at least a dozen shorter doll nests on uh, thirty some miles of transects. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and, and again, the young varied in size. I mean, we laid them all out and there were, the youngest young was that tall and the oldest was that tall. I mean, all just line them up in a row and just yeah. draw a line right across the top of their heads and uh -huh. just went right down to that. How long does it take them from hatch to fully fledging, leaving the nest? Uh, about the same as incubation. Uh, I'll say roughly, you know, with these great grays, and I think it's similar with the other ones, uh, three weeks and maybe with a cavity nesting owl that needs to be flight ready, uh, might be a little bit longer than that. The, the, some of these owls, like the short ear he talked about, great grays and great horn, they branch. Uh, they just start walking away from their nests before they can fly. It's the strangest thing, uh, but it's a dispersing mechanism so that if something comes to the nest, they don't get them all at once and the parents keep track of where the young go. Northern hawk owls do it. In fact, if you find an owl uh, fledgling on the shoulder of the road or somewhere, leave it alone, because it's fine. And we've had northern hawk owls brought back to town uh, repeatedly and then driven them back out to uh, near the Million Dollar Bridge where they were nesting and put them back, because uh, people can't help themselves if they find a baby owl out all by itself. Um, so uh, anyway, they branch, they walk or climb branches like a parrot, uh, you know, with their bill and their claws and, and disperse and, uh, you know, away from the nest. And the parents keep track and feed them uh, where they go. And you want to talk about the track here? Oh, that's a, that's a great gray owl um, imprint, but it's, I wish I put something in there for size comparison, but it's a lot bigger than the short-eared owl um, imprint. Yeah. And, um, and they, they definitely go into the snow a good ways if you have a couple foot layer they'll they'll go right down into it just to grab a mouse that they can't see um, they're just triangulating with their with their asymmetrically arranged ears and the last of the daytime owls 
that you could see around here uh, is Snowy Owl. Uh, has, who's seen one around here? And you can see it on your rooftop, especially if you have chickens. Wouldn't that be nice? Like down in Eccles? No, you this was taken in Anchorage. In Anchorage uh, yeah. You took it? Um, I did, yeah. yeah. Mr. White Key's house. It uh, was just across no. from the street. I've yeah. seen one out of Egg Island years ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, been They're probably fairly regular on Egg Island and Boswell Bay and the Barrier <coughs> Islands if we were ever out there looking. That's where they would be in the winter. There has been a very regular one on the top of the Hemi Range in winter that uh, Dana and I and many snowmobilers have seen over the years. Um, that's probably the same bird. I've seen it on two different seasons. Um, anyway, they're, they're around here on some winters, uh, probably some winters more than others. Uh, this one was in Anchorage. Uh, these pictures I took in Vancouver, sometimes, they're eruptive. Some years a lot migrate from the Arctic and show up in the lower 48, and uh, that's where these pictures were taken. I think you'll know it if you see it, uh, although some other owls, even a great horn in flight in your headlights or a short ear, can look quite white in your headlights, but you'll know a, a snowy when you see it, yeah? Well, great horn owls in the interior, some of them are really light colored. Pale, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So you could get fooled, but you'll know it when you see it, a, a, a snowy owl, I think. And now we're going to talk <laughs> to the nocturnal owls, these son of a guns that are actually quite common, uh, but you never see them. And this is why. Do you guys see the owl? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In the daytime, they find a little branch or a clump of brush or you know, a conifer, and they roost and never move. Um, there's, there's a couple things that can tip you off. One is whitewash, poop, uh, if they roost in the same place. The other is birds or, or um, a squirrel or something can, can scold them if they, if they discover them. This is Aaron's picture, but I keep on getting this wrong. It's a solway, right? Yep, that is right yeah. here. What's neat about them, if you are ever lucky enough to find one, is that they're very tame. They just think nothing will ever see them, and if you are lucky enough to find one, you can almost pick it up. Uh, they're, they're that tame. And Lauren will be able to chime in here. These next two pictures are Lauren Banks. Um, Kim Menster, I think, spotted this one by the high school. Down by Curtin's place. Yeah. Okay. And uh, tell us about how tame it was. And ice worm. <laughs> yeah, it was very yeah. ice worm great. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm envious because I've only photographed a couple in my life. They're beautiful little birds if you're lucky enough to find one, uh, but they're secretive and they don't budge. And bees and boreals and screech owls all behave the same uh, and are almost equally common around here. Maybe not so much the boreal, but you're not going to see them very often. You're very, very lucky if you do. In in Homer, um, there's a, an owl bander, um, Jason, um, who's banding owls in Homer. He, he'll get, he'll get a couple. I think what was it, hundred and I want to say maybe two hundred was his um, his high uh, for a, for a fairly short fall season of migration migration for yeah. for catching these. So and he'll catch multiples in it. At a night, in a night. Yeah. Instead of a mist net at a night, mist net. Yeah. Yeah. catch them just passing through. So he'll catch, yeah. you know, 10. <laughs> he, he'll catch, you know, 10 in the evening. So they're, they're a lot out there. They're, they're very dense, but uh, just running across one is pretty hard. That one that I, that first photo, I, I had my camera on there and I would, I would take a picture and then I would put my camera down. And I'd try to find it again. Like, where did it go? And I'm trying to take another picture and I had to look up my binoculars. Oh yeah, there it is. This is one of the few that I've seen in daytime. Uh, this was in Montana. Um, anyway, they're striking little birds if you're lucky enough. And, but tame as all get out. And this is one of the other ones that I've seen. Uh, this was in Vancouver. Um, if you're lucky enough to find a roosting bird. Um, I have mute the songs. So they're so hard to see, you almost never see them. So it's better to recognize their calls or songs than you know, planning on you know, finding one. 
And unfortunately, I can't do both at the same time. Just when I hook up my laptop with HDMI, it shuts the sound off. So we'll play the songs afterwards. But we'll play you the songs of this, uh, a northern sawwet, and, and these next uh, two birds, three birds. This is also why they are so hard to find. Um, this is an eastern screech owl, not a western screech owl. We have western screech owls here. But they can roost in plain view and you would never see them. Uh, this one's filling up half of a cavity and uh, you just wouldn't see it. Uh, we got this on a Christmas bird count and shared in Wyoming. Uh, uh, anyway, beautiful birds by, by their, uh, how camouflaged they are. Uh, but they can sit in full view and you just walk by them all day. Um, this is one of our local western screech owls. They're actually quite common. Uh, you know, if you go out listening for owls calling at night, um, this is one of the ones you're more most likely to hear. It's actually kind of equal so northern sawwets and western screech, probably a little heavier to sawwets depending on where you are. But we have them right around town. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll play the songs for you uh, here shortly. Um, but the song is how you're going to pick them out. Um, there's a few people who are lucky enough to see them, you know, uh, walking at night with the flashlight. But uh, anyway, that's not the rule. That's not the norm. This is one uh, here near town, fledging. Uh, Dana Smite called me up on my anniversary, one o'clock in the morning or something, said, Milo, there's baby owls around my house. And so I went down there, and uh, there, sure enough, there were baby owls around his house. And this is the last of the little owls that you never see, uh, a boreal owl. And, and they're, they're, uh -huh. yeah. um, they're, they're the ones we hear the least around here. And they're probably more common if you were to get up into the foothills in the mountains, which we don't, especially at night in the winter and, and things like that. Um, they have been seen near McKinley Cabin and heard along the road uh, somewhere near McKinley might be some of the better habitat for them around Cordova. They're common in Anchorage and the interior. Uh, but anyway, they're a very small owl, a little bit bigger than a sawwet. Uh, this is the only one I've photographed. Uh, wh where was this one, Aaron? That was uh, at Anchorage Airport. Okay. Anchorage. Uh, this was on the Kenai, outside a friend's house. Um, I told you, how the one thing that can tip you off to owls that are hidden well, and that is like birds scolding them or squirrels. If something else sees them, in fact, something that they eat and is a threat to them, if they can find it in daytime, they're gonna warn everybody about it and bark or uh, scold or, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So while I was photographing this one, the squirrel found it. <laughs> and the squirrel's giving it a hard time. <laughs> The the um, I've seen I've seen flocks of chickadees, they and they won't necessarily like a flock of chickadees and nuthatches. They won't always just um, mob the bird. They'll they'll just start feeding in the general area, and then they'll intermittently mob it. So mm -hmm. they'll go in and mob it for you know thirty seconds, forty five seconds, and then it'll fly off. And you if you didn't know better, you'd think the bird had flown off. But then they'll just start feeding in the area and then come back at the bird with, you know, <laughs> renewed vigor and start mobbing it again. And they just want to keep track, yeah, you know, yeah. keep track of the bird. And we have a lot of crows in town. Periodically, you'll see the crows going nuts. And a lot of times we just tune it out. But don't, because there is something there, a hawk or an owl, most likely, or a cat. That could be someone's cat. <laughs> but most likely it's a goshawk or an owl of some kind. And... Just try to find it. Uh, start peeking into the trees and vegetation and see if you can't pick it out. And that'll be one of the clues sometimes for these hard to see birds. Uh, we'll play the song of a, a boreal here shortly. And then the last owl that we're going to cover is uh, this one. What's this? Great horn. And this one we probably see here as much or more than northern hawk owls. They are nocturnal, so they don't hunt in daylight very much. But if you're driving near forested areas out the road, um, you might flush one uh, or see them roosting on a sign and uh, you hear them calling maybe more. People recognize this as your classic owl call. The hoo hoo hoo. Uh, these, are the, these are the ones. 
that they do who cooks for you. A uh, barn owl, which we don't have here, says who cooks for you. These guys say don't kill owls, save owls. <laughs> uh, and and we'll, we'll play it for you here shortly. But uh, and these are two pictures from my friend Tim Graham's in Anchorage, the uh, great horned owls. And if you ever do have the audacity to play the call to get them to come in, you know. Um, have have your back up against something, yes. <laughs> or wear a hat, yeah. or wear and, and wear a hat. Yeah. <laughs> they are, they will draw talent through your skill. What was that owl that was attacking the spears in Anchorage? Great horn, great horn. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I'll just review real quick uh, some things about the Christmas bird count. It's this Saturday. Um, it's our forty seventh count in Cordova. It's the 119th count annually. These things have been going on for 119 years in, in, the, in North America. Um, ours is Saturday, December 15th. So we'll start at the Cordova Center, which is what we did last year. Uh, go to the uh, education room on the, that main floor you enter in, and uh, we'll have coffee and juice and donuts and some fruit maybe. Um, and we'll get, make sure everybody's put on a route. Uh, we'll have a route leader. And uh, we'll put everybody on a route, make sure there's experienced birders with uh, people who want to learn. And uh, once we have that all organized um, and people know where who they belong to, we'll all disperse. And then you can do your routes at your leisure with whoever your, your group leader is. And, uh, and have a great day. Let's, you know, again, hope for the weather, uh, good weather. It's supposed to be clear. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah, great. Um, and at 6 p.m., we'll meet at Marianne Bishop's house. And I didn't print maps, but we'll have maps uh, Saturday morning for people who don't know where she lives. Uh, we'll have a potluck, and after we, everybody's had dinner, uh, we'll compile the results and go through. It's, it's a fun thing. We make even a competition out of it uh, to see who found the rarest thing or the most species and who got you know, the, the neatest bird. So it, it turns into a really fun event uh, when we compile these. Uh, so the, the rules that we, you know, kind of fall under for, you know, uh, you know, conducting a Christmas bird count nationally, they all have to take place between, uh, these dates right here, uh, uh they have to take place between December 14th and January 5th, every count in North America, and there's hundreds of these things. It's a real popular event, you know, throughout the country. Um, the count circle that we have, and I'll show maps in a minute, is centered at the Eak Weir, and it's seven and a half mile radius. Um, and I'll show you what it encompasses here shortly. On count day, we count every species of bird that people see and <coughs> the numbers of them. Like this group saw ten chestnut back chickadees. This group saw two chestnut back chickadees. This one saw seventy, uh, and we'll compile everybody's tally of each species and so we'll not only get the species that they that they see but the numbers of them but in contrast to that count week you're allowed to count the species towards your species total three days before the count and three days after the count so tomorrow morning these these birds that are hard to get you know like an owl or a rare thing or if we get weathered out on Saturday for some reason um, Tomorrow we can start counting uh, the species. So if you guys see something noteworthy, give me a call. Uh, did I have my phone number on? I think I have it on the next one. Uh, I'll, I'll get my, put my phone number up here. Um, a lot of you know how to get a hold of me. You can call the Forest Service office and ask for me during the day. And uh, yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, let me know uh, what you see, and we'll start it towards our, our, our species total. But uh, take pictures if you're not sure what you're seeing. Uh, and we can rack up some species starting tomorrow. Like, make sure we get the tufted duck if Trey Losey or you guys want to go uh, out looking for it. See if, if anybody gets lucky with an owl this week, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, three days before, three days after the official count. I put the dates. Uh, Wednesday through Tuesday. Can you talk? Can somebody sort of go over what's been seen around town? Are there flying grosbeaks? beaks? Are there wax wings? Or? Um, songbird wise, pine grosbeaks beaks and white winged crossbills, uh, low numbers. 
Um, the white wing crossbills I've seen them down in Eccles. Uh, I've seen them up on Ski Hill. Um, around town, I'll hear one or two. Pine Grove Street, same. You know, you hear the. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> a little bit like a robin. Yeah, yeah. The, the whistling note. Um, what else? Juncos, I've seen a couple here and there. There's the song sparrows, like along the breakwater trail. Um, uh, white crown, low numbers of white crown sparrows, maybe a couple, in maybe three or four that I've noticed in town. Um, Thanks, Tony. Star, uh, um, starlings, um, Trey, uh, oh. Drew, Drew uh, Lindau, he, he reported three um, about two weeks ago out on the Breakwater Trail. Um, so that's, that's rare for Cordova, yeah. and it might become rare um, <laughs> if, if some people well, get their way with them. Well, I forgot about uh, the Glaucus skull. Right, is that, have you seen that lately? Okay. Have you seen that lately? Uh, no, just that one time. I okay. About. There's an adult, an adult, an adult glaucus skull. It's it's a reoccurring bird. I think it's been coming to town about three years ever oh. since I moved here. Uh -huh. you know, it's been coming to town. Yeah. It was a young bird. Now it's a, an adult. Uh -huh. um, they often young um, odd gulls will just keep repeatedly going to the same place year after year. But um, so watch for a really light light uh, plumaged gull. Breakwater area. Um, AC so in general, there's low diversity in numbers around just because Chickies, of the weather. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. has, Creepers. Has we, I haven't seen red, any of the new red poles. Are they around at all? I've, I've not heard any red poles since maybe October or early November. Siskins, I've heard a couple, like just really a couple, like. You know, sporadic yeah. groups. But have you seen any Carl? Have you seen any siskins? Any pine siskins? No yeah. pine. Okay. They used to be come, come real regularly at the feeder. Yeah. They're they're very um, like most finches. They're very uh, sporadic. Yeah. You know, year I, to year. I would expect someone on the delta with on the alder habitat on the delta might find red poles. They seem you know, yeah. even without an invasion years, they seem to be out there in low numbers. But we're really low, low numbers of ducks in the lagoon this year. We had uh, maybe mm, 75 mallards, but they were only like really there in that number yeah. huh. one day, and uh -huh. then they, they showed up briefly a couple other days, but not in those numbers. Nothing My, wants to be here. One, Lots of barrows <laughs> and um, One possibility is there's just, it's just so warm uh -huh. that they're very dispersed. You know, there's they're not concentrating in their in their traditional frozen spots. Andrew and I were out on the delta at about probably at about thirty three miles walking, and I thought I heard a goose twice. Right. Yeah, uh, Lance That's saw good. one right. Uh, th th there was some seen in the inlet recently as well. Yeah, about ten days ago. Yeah. So it could have been. Could. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Been. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, odd year. So some tips, stock your bird feeders now. I think we can finally say most of the bears are sleeping. Uh, uh, thank goodness, because <laughs> it was a rough year for us, and but more so for bears, I have to say. Um, start looking for those hard to get species tomorrow. Call me, there's my phone number, uh, 5878, and let's hope for good weather. Uh, we also need feeder watchers, mm -hmm. so if you don't want to go out in the field with us, uh, you can stay home and watch your feeder. And it doesn't matter if there's a, a few birds or a lot of birds, that's what we're documenting, whatever is here. So if you just call me at the end of the day and said I only saw three chickadees today, that's what we're documenting. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's good information for us. Um, and we have a number of people who do this annually, I'll be getting some of them calling them up here shortly. And, oh, data recorders. So those of you that lead groups, these are some kind of pet peeves or things that just help me out. Uh, you'll get a data form, and on the form, don't just assume that I'll remember who Joe was. Uh, write out the full team member names. Uh, write the starting and ending times. Write the date, because these data forms show up years later. I'm trying to remember whose it was and when it was. I try to fix this at the end of the day, but I don't always. Uh, 
write down all these things that I have on the data form. You know, don't leave blanks. Uh, miles covered, whether it was hiking, well, both hiking, boating, driving, uh, hours spent, record that as well. These are all things that I have to enter, and I'm going to make them up if you don't give them to me, and I'd rather not make them up. Uh, so uh, hours spent driving, walking, and boating in addition to the miles that you've covered. Uh, hours spent observing feeders, you know, how much, if you're going to be a feeder watcher, just tell me, you don't have to watch it all day, just say, I only watched it for an hour and I saw three chickadees, that's, that's what I need. And then take pictures if you're unsure of things. And the route, and, and that, that's how I'll end it. So our count circle is centered right here at the EF here. This is a seven and a half mile radius. It goes out the road, here's the airport, uh, to almost the uh, um, Sheridan Road. Um, it includes Cabin Lakes and the road out here, the yeah, trail and stuff. Uh, well, I'll go through individual routes uh, and what, what, what intersected here. The town route is uh, a neat one because of people's feeders and the structures around town. It's surprising. Some of the neatest birds show up in town. Uh, some of the neat sparrows and, and things like that. Uh, I think Aaron will probably lead that route. I haven't really uh, staked out who's going to lead what route, but uh, some people uh, typically do certain routes. I like to walk a lot. If I do that, I'll probably uh -huh. walk a lot. <laughs> Copper River Highway route. So uh, start, well, we'll, everybody will work out where the borders of the routes were, are, and we have some typical lines that, that we follow. Uh, sometimes we use Lefevre for this, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about where the Copper River Highway route starts, and it goes all the way up here like we discussed. Uh, so that's one of our routes. <coughs> the White Shed Road. Uh, starts, uh, well, we usually start that around the ball field or something, uh, and then you're not going to be around, did you say, Michelle? No, uh, I'm going to be here. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you'll do Eccles Lagoon. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm really, at some day, I want to go on the city route with Okay. Karen, okay. We'll, well, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. Yeah? Think about what you want, and uh, we'll, find, we'll find people to do everything. Uh, anyway, the White Shed Road, unfortunately, our count circle cuts out Hartney Bay. That is super unfortunate because it's a great birding spot for us, but you can see it leaves it out completely. Uh, up in, you can walk up the trail, the Heaney Ridge Trail and in the forest, and you can see some of this wetland up here. <coughs> but that's a really unfortunate thing uh, for us. <coughs> Eccles Lagoon uh, is its own little route, and Michelle often does that. With, with others, uh, Orca Road, so from town out to uh, Orca Cannery, uh, um, along the waterfront there, Kelly and Susan, I'll call, call them, they often lead that one, but uh, again, we're open. <coughs> and Power Creek, uh, out to Power Creek Road, starting from uh, town uh, all the way out to the end of the road, a lot of the lake stuff, a lot of neat species show up there because of the open creek and the salmon at the end. Uh, we set state record oftentimes for the number of bald eagles counted. Uh, it's, it's not frozen up. It, we, Except now that the road's cut off. It, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, but you can still see walk. you can still see 35 eagles out there at the end of the road. Uh -huh. Yeah. The coho salmon is going to be a lot out there. Yep. And there could yeah. be some on the highway, too. Yeah. Right there, yeah. there would probably be more if things were frozen up and they were forced into certain locations. But uh, it's pretty open right now. And then we have two boat routes. Dave Janko's not here tonight, but he takes the offlet out and he's gonna do North Orca Inlet. And then I'll take my boat out and we'll do uh, South Orca Inlet. Uh, so that's typically how we break it out. And Mary Ann's place where we meet at, uh, uh, when I say six o'clock, is here's Second Street that we are, you know, we're in the office right here. Uh, here's the elementary school, the Catholic Church, just go up here, she's on the corner right there and I'll have this map to pass out for six o'clock Saturday night. Potluck. Potluck. Yep. Bring something. I have a non-bird question. It's a bear question. Uh-huh. Do you know how many bears got shot? Does anybody know? It's appro it, it approached 20 in town, 20. reported bears. Yeah. Okay. There was two or three brown bears that I, I know of and a lot of black bears. And don't get me started. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're going to do owl calls. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 
barely just sitting on the side of the uh -huh. road. Right it's kind of white. You're, you're probably seeing short-eared owls or great horn. That's most likely. Oh, they're small. I don't think they're oh, small. Short-eared yeah. would be okay. most likely. Uh, okay. Where, where about? Oh. oh, just, you know, just oh. like going out to towards the airport. Six so. miles to the airport. Yeah. Six miles. Huh. Like, re really yeah, small? Yeah, really? They're like sometimes they'll be sitting on those, uh, those little uh, reflector posts. Okay. Huh? And you're not, you know, at that night, you're yeah. not paying too much attention and all of a sudden. Just the... Yeah. Okay, now I, I can't do both, show the slides and play the call, mm -hmm. but... You hear that? Squeaky wheel. It, squeaky wheel is a good. I use that to remember another a songbird called the Townsend Solitaire, but that's a good way to remember Northern Solvet Owl. It's a series of toots. You know, some owls don't go who who. Uh, I remember, I think in my advertisement I said, do all owls go who or hoot or something? Uh, a lot of them don't. They have toots or, or other sounds that they make. They don't say the classic you know who. Um, Northern Sawwet just goes toot, 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 over and over and over again. In fact, you can sometimes imitate it. And you can call them in doing that. Uh, if you hear one at night, imitate it, and most often, if you're close at all, they'll come and land quite close to you and, and start calling you. And if you have a flashlight or something, you can get uh, a really good look. They have different pitches, so some will... They'll sometimes duet, and they'll have a low one, and there'll be a higher pitch and a lower pitch. And then all these owls, in addition to what I'll call their song that I just played, have other squeaks and call, call notes and other uh, sounds they make that are much, diff much more difficult to identify per species. Um, and the sawwet. And I won't pretend that I would have known what this was had I heard this at night. Uh, it can be a little tricky. Uh, but that's uh, a call from a northern sawwet. I remember some of my cats in distress. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, cat calls. <laughs> Whoa, what's that? So sawwet is a very common owl. If you were to stop at night and listen, you might hear. This is the other one that we hear quite often around town, the Western Screech Owl. And the way people remember this uh, call, song, whatever you want to call it, is it sounds like somebody dropping a ping pong ball and it's bouncing faster and faster. <laughs> Just like a bouncing ping pong ball. And it's quite distinct if you, you know, start. Got it? Okay. They'll also do a, a shrill, especially if there's yeah. something. Yeah, these are some of those cat call notes they make. Yeah, but there's probably many different sounds. They can sound like a small dog barking. Burp, burp, burp. It's just kind of like that. Yeah. Well, sometimes they'll do it kind of. The. I think it's like you get that whistle going. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of. Then they do a shriek. Uh, and then this one is. I used to be able to do it. Now my whistle's broken. Um, this is one that we don't hear around here that often, but we can, the boreal owl. Um, to me, these sound just like a snipe. Yeah. 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 And if you, it was a twilight or something, you might not be quite sure what you're hearing. Uh, it's like almost like identical to a snipe. Um, it does get a little higher pitch. Way up there, or is it coming from the tree? Yeah. 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 So that's the boreal owl, one you're not so likely to get here unless you're looking for it. And then everybody's classic owl, and one that's common around here, you can sometimes hoot, hear them hooting from right downtown, right here, is uh, the great horned owl. And this is your classic owl. Kill owls, save owls. It's sort of the pattern that someone taught me sometimes. Who do you who? Who do you? And here's 
uh, just some call notes. So they all can make some weird sounds that might lead that might lead you confused. But when they're mating and doing their songs to attract mates, that's the classic, you know, calls that I love playing for you. They do a they do a shrill one. A in the past, like in March or something, and we brought in a sawwet to flashlight range that the whole group got to see 10 feet yeah. away. Were you there, Carl? I, yeah, I think I was. Yeah, and then we got to see a, a western screech also. I think we got two owls that had to come in to call so people got to see. Maybe we'll do that again in the spring. Yeah, that'd be fun. Okay, any questions? I've got one comment. Uh, I usually go out at 6.30 or 7 on the count day. And when I call for great horned owls, I'll call on the hour every 15 minutes or so. So if you hear an owl that doesn't sound quite like oh, a great it's horn, me. it's me. And if it's 7.15 in the morning, it's me. Wait another 10 minutes and right. see if it's still calling. Yeah, and I call usually three times and that's it. 